So the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission is the state agency responsible for managing natural resources. This is a state agency who is part of the state government, looks over things such as the rules for fishing for both saltwater and freshwater, um, they issue permits for land uses, uh, and also monitor terrestrial as well as aquatic uh, wildlife. So as part of this agency, we, we work for the Division of Marine Fisheries Management, uh, which oversees saltwater fishing, both licenses, rules, permits, um, but also scientific research, and conduct outreach and education programs as well. So as part of that division, we have the lionfish control team, which looks after an invasive marine species, which we'll talk about today. So first I wanna go over what an invasive species is. Um, invasive and non-native are probably terms you have heard before um, when talking about biology terms, and these are important definitions to understand in order to uh, fully grasp what an invasive species is and what we're uh, referring to. So I'll go a little bit over what non-native is in another slide. Um, invasive species, this is a species that uh, is not from this region or the region that we're talking about. So in this case, Florida, this is a species that was introduced in some form, either from human um, interaction or some other sort of uh, change in the ecosystem that allowed this species to travel to this new region. And it also is causing some form of negative impact. So this may be negative impact to people in terms of causing a danger to human health. It may damage economic resources such as tourism or agriculture, uh, or it may threaten native ecosystems by preying directly on native species, spreading diseases, um, or degrading habitat in some form. So an invasive species is causing one or several of these negative impacts. Uh, research has demonstrated that invasive species often have characteristics or they can outcompete native species, change the biodiversity and community structure of an ecosystem, and may change the entire dynamic of an ecosystem in that process. Um, they typically uh, reproduce faster, uh, eat more, and take over space a lot faster than native species. And they may even introduce pathogens in the process of spreading throughout that ecosystem. So some common examples include things like the Burmese python, um, an aquatic plant called hydrilla, which often clogs up storm drains, uh, or a terrestrial plant called kudzu, which was introduced through packaging um, and has covered over a lot of vegetation in the southeast of the U.S. and can even pull down large trees. So an invasive versus non-native, I had mentioned those two terms before, and it's important to know the distinction. Um, non-native refers to a species that is not from that local region or the ecosystem that we're talking about. So in this case, a species that doesn't naturally occur in Florida would be considered non-native. A non-native species may not be causing harm of any type um, within the ecosystem. It may be something that was just introduced and has a negligent effect on the ecosystem. Um, there are actually 41 non-native marine fish introduced to Florida. Only five have become established. So lionfish is the worst of these examples, and um, a non-native species uh, is considered also an invasive species if it is also causing negative impacts. Um, so lionfish being the worst of these examples, uh, it has become what we call established. And established means that this is a species that is now able to reproduce on its own and successfully thrive within this new ecosystem. So this is a population curve um, or population graph. You might see this in referring to ecology. Um, this is uh, kind of a good pattern to see with a lot of different species will follow this trend. So I wanted to introduce this idea for an invasive species. As you go across the bottom on the x-axis you'll see time continuing on after the invasion has started and along the y-axis as you move up that's the amount of population as the population grows or declines. So most invasive species follow a fairly predictable pattern. You'll see the introduction begins um, in the corner there in the bottom left. There's a little bit of a lag time or delay after there's an in invasive species introduced to an ecosystem. Typically, this is just an amount of time where you don't see any real change in the ecosystem. The species hasn't really found a habitat or a food source yet. So there's a little bit of a delay after an introduction typically before you see any big changes. Then where you see the large curve as the 
graph goes up. Um, that is the rapid and exponential growth as an invasive species finds the um, new resources, starts to use those resources, gathers habitat, and starts to expand into this new ecosystem. As it reaches that tallest point on the graph, there will be a period of time where that population will exceed the carrying capacity or the amount of resources that that ecosystem can support. There is usually a little bit of a dip. Sometimes it's a big crash, and you might see that invasive species population decline pretty rapidly. Then there is a little bit of time after that where the species starts to grow and expand a little bit more again, and then there's a leveling off. You'll see that the species kind of reaches its carrying capacity and finds a niche within that ecosystem. Sometimes invasive species can go through what we call boom and bust cycles, where you will see a large growth may go way over the carrying capacity, and then there's a crash. And the population will decline really rapidly, and then it'll grow again, and then it will crash. And there's not so much of a solid line where you'd see a evening out of that population for some time. So lionfish is a fairly standard example of this invasion trend um, population pattern. And we think that they're somewhere within um, a slight decline now as we're seeing slightly lower numbers. So this is a fairly predictable pattern that you can see with most other invasive species as well. There are 41 other non-native marine fishes in Florida that we know of. And this number is likely to grow as climate change changes a lot of the habitat and the temperature around the um, around Florida's waters. We're also to see an expansion in aquarium trade, which will possibly increase the number of species that could be traveling through the state. So of those 41 non-native marine fishes, five have become established. Remember from our previous slide, established meaning that that species is able to survive and reproduce within this new ecosystem with no interference from other species or from people. Now these other non-native marine fishes don't have the same effects or negative impacts that we see with lionfish. Um, some of them we don't know what the effects are yet. One of the notable species, uh, the fish on the far right, that is a regal damselfish, also an Indo-Pacific species, that is now being reported in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, other species, like the second from the far right, the yellow and purple fish, is a fairy basslet. It's actually a Caribbean fish that has spread north as water temperatures have been increasing around um, Florida. So we're seeing its range expanding into Florida waters. So of those non-native marine fishes, lionfish are the most damaging and best established. Um, it's important to note that most of our reports of non-native marine fishes have come from citizen scientists. So it's important to know the species that are native to your region and to keep an eye out for some of these invasive species. Lionfish, this is an Indo-Pacific species. Um, there are roughly 20 odd species of lionfish in the world. Uh, the two that we are referring to here are both from the genus Tarawa, and they are the red lionfish and the fire devilfish. So these two species are visually identical, they behave the same, um, they grow to roughly the same size. About 97% of the lionfish that we see in Florida are red lionfish. So the only way to tell the difference is through a genetic test. So we just colloquially refer to them as lionfish. But those are the two species we're specifically referring to here. They are now established within the Western Atlantic, the Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, recent research has shown that they are fairly genetically similar. Roughly about 100 individuals was all that it took to start this invasion. Um, and so they are very genetically homogenous. In this range, they are growing to larger size and also reaching a far higher population density in this invaded range than in their native habitat in the Indo-Pacific. So here they can reach up to 19 inches is the record in the Gulf of Mexico, and about 15 inches is their largest size in the native habitat. So lionfish were first observed and reported in southeast Florida off Dania Beach in 1985. And in the last 30 years, this population has spread across the east coast of the United States on the Western Atlantic, down to the Caribbean Sea, throughout the Gulf of Mexico, and has now started to spread along the coast of Venezuela and Brazil. This is the most rapidly expanding marine invasion in history. The only thing that really keeps their population from spreading beyond those parameters is water temperature. So lionfish cannot survive 
temperatures below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So those reported sightings in New England along the coast of Rhode Island and Massachusetts, when the water temperature rises to about 50 degrees in the summertime, lionfish can ride the currents and survive up there, but only for a few months. So their year-round range stops at about the border of North Carolina and Virginia. So I want to go over the invasive characteristics of lionfish that make them such great invaders. Um, there's essentially no marine habitat that lionfish have not been able to invade and successfully become established. So they've successfully invaded the waters, as I had mentioned, in the Atlantic and Gulf Coast of Florida. Um, they can survive a wide range of salinity and pressure uh, and water quality changes. So these dense populations can be found in deeper waters offshore, in natural and artificial reefs, hard bottom structures, ledges, as well as shallow and inshore environments such as estuaries, bays, and rivers. So lionfish are also able to reproduce within the first year when they reach maturity, and they spawn about 30,000 eggs in these two gelatinous egg masses each time that they spawn. It's not a very remarkable number. 30,000 eggs is fairly typical for reef fish. However, lionfish are able to reproduce for multiple months when the water temperatures are warm, which expands their window of time to have a larger number of eggs reach maturity. In these marine habitats, they're able to survive from one to a thousand feet of water, which is a lot of pressure change they're able to withstand. This includes uh, habitats such as coral reefs, seagrass beds, artificial reefs, mangroves, as well as estuary and even river mouth environments. They're also able to withstand temperature changes from warm tropical waters. This is a tropical Pacific fish to as low as 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a fairly wide range for reef fish. Their salinity tolerance is also very impressive from four parts per thousand to 35 parts per thousand. So we measure salt water and parts per thousand molecules. Um, Seawater is considered 35 parts per thousand. So four is very close to fresh water. So they can survive close to fresh water all the way to full seawater. Any of those habitats, they're able to withstand the changes this is a demersal species, meaning that they live on the ocean floor. And they often look for ledges and overhangs anywhere with shadow to provide a little bit of protection. They are primarily active during the dawn and dusk hours. They also have a high sight fidelity, so they tend to find a place. And they tend not to migrate far distances from that stage. Once they recruit or um, have come, hatch from their larval stage, to an adult stage, they are able to stay in that, they stay in that habitat for a long period of time. I also want to go over some anatomical terms so you understand the regions of the fish we're talking about when talking about spines on a lionfish. So dorsal refers to the back of the fish where the spine is. So that's the top ridge, ventral being the belly or the underside of the fish. And there are several fins or fin regions that you should be familiar with. So on the sides, those large fins um, behind the eye, but on the side of the fish are referred to as pectoral fins. The pelvic fins are underneath that on the belly side of the fish. The anal fin is towards the back on the underside of the fish. The tail fin is referred to as the caudal fin, and any fins along the dorsal ridge are called dorsal fins or dorsal spines. In the case of lionfish, there are 13 dorsal spines on the top, one on the front of each of the pelvic fins, and so that's where the pelvic spines are, and three at the front of the anal fin, the anal spines. It's important to know the difference between venomous and poisonous. Poisonous animals are animals that create a toxin or a chemical which must be absorbed or ingested in some form to cause harm to another organism. So these are chemicals that when touched or eaten or breathed in would cause harm. Venomous refers to a chemical that must be injected in some form, either through a bite or a sting. Lionfish are considered a venomous species as they have defensive spines, and these spines are used purely for defense. It's not a predatory tool or a weapon. Um, and the neurotoxin that lionfish house is not lethal to people, but does cause a very painful sting. And the protein within that neurotoxin can only be broken down by applying heat to it. To go over some of the species that lionfish target, um, they go after economically important species. So these are species that we rely on for seafood that support um, thriving businesses around Florida. 
as well as species we also like to eat. So these are things such as juvenile grouper, snapper, uh, flounder, crustaceans, such as crabs, lobsters, and shrimp. And lionfish target a lot of these species in their juvenile stages. And without large numbers of juveniles, as the adult populations age or are removed through fishing or predation, there will be fewer of them for uh, replacement in the population in the future. And this can cause many years of damage to a fishery as fewer juveniles will be able to replace those adults as they are removed by diseases, age, or fishing pressure. Lionfish also target ecologically important species. So these are herbivores or grazers, as well as species that target parasites. So fish such as wrasses and uh, shrimp like cleaner shrimp will remove parasites from the outer scales of other fish. This helps to limit the spread of diseases and parasites within an ecosystem. Parrotfishes and damselfish also remove algae, which allows sunlight to reach coral polyps so they can photosynthesize and make food. Without access to sunlight, coral reefs will die and the habitat will shift towards a mostly algae-based habitat, which doesn't support the same level of biodiversity or habitat or food. So some of the effects that lionfish have on native ecosystems, they are considered opportunistic generalists. This means that lionfish will prey on anything that is convenient for them to get a hold of, so they can eat anything up to about half of their own body size. And they rotate between different prey items based on what is most easily captured or most readily available. They're known to prey on more than 90 species of native fish and invertebrates. And these native species um, do not exhibit avoidance as they are not used to seeing lionfish as an introduced species, so they don't have the same avoidance behavior with other predators. When we talk about recruitment, as it's important for an ecosystem to have juveniles to replace the older populations, as mentioned before, lionfish are particularly detrimental uh, to the recruitment of other populations of fish as they're able to reduce that juvenile biomass by up to 79% in some places within six weeks. Um, and they also reduce by two and a half times compared to a native predator, the amount of recruiting juveniles that are available in an ecosystem. Aside from the direct predatory effects that lionfish have, it's also important to note some non-consumptive effects that they have on an ecosystem. So even larger predators, such as adult groupers or snappers, may change their behavior and may avoid habitats with lionfish to avoid competing with them for the same space and the same prey items, as they often overlap in what they prey on. So lionfish will target a lot of algae eaters, which often causes a change towards algae-dominated landscapes, which will also change the types of species you would find there. And the only known predator of lionfish in the invaded range are people. So people are using pole spears are able to target lionfish while diving. And it's estimated that if they're able to remove 65% of the adult lionfish on a reef, this may open up the ecosystem and allow these native predators to reestablish themselves. So this graph on the left shows the types of gear that are used in the commercial market to target lionfish. So because humans are the only predators of lionfish, um, I wanted to go over some of the gear that is used in the commercial market to target lionfish. And this is helpful for the native ecosystem by allowing those native predators to move back into the ecosystem and opening up those environments by removing this invasive species. Most of these lionfish are captured by spearfishing while diving. Um, and this is also an animal that targets moving uh, prey items. So hook and line or the traditional rod and reel fishing is typically not successful in removing them. And we don't see an awful lot of captures of lionfish using trawls or traps. So this is predominantly that blue color being divers. So FWC has multiple programs to help educate the public about lionfish and to help people get involved in helping to protect our native ecosystems and remove lionfish from Florida waters. So some programs uh, specifically help divers by offering prizes or helping to support tournaments around the state for divers that are targeting lionfish and they can win prizes um, and compete in events such as the challenge which goes on from may to september each year and we also support research projects looking into potential trap or rov operated uh, technologies to target lionfish our education programs 
such as online materials and presentations and classroom dissections help to educate people about lionfish and their effects on Florida ecosystems. There's also annual events such as the Lionfish Removal and Awareness Day, which is a large festival with art vendors and educational booths, as well as the opportunity to taste lionfish, which is the third weekend in May, hosted in Destin. FWC further encourages people to remove lionfish by removing regulatory um, requirements for lionfish harvest for both recreational and commercial harvesters. This video shows um, several FWC divers harvesting lionfish on a wreck off the coast of Carabao. This is about 100 feet underwater, and you'll notice the density of lionfish is very heavy here. So most of the wreck is covered with lionfish, and there are very few other species uh, visible in this video. So most of the lionfish, as you watch them, they do not show what we call avoidance behavior. So they don't have any predators in this invaded range. So they are not moving as divers are targeting them. They're unaware that they are in danger.